Praise God. Let's open our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I just want to say um, that I'm glad to be home, amen? amen. Um, did a lot of, um, wasn't gone for too long, but I was talking to um, uh, my pastor, Pastor Rosario. I was telling him that um, I don't think I can be an evangelist. I don't, I don't like being away from my wife that much. I'm not needy. <laughs> But when I'm gone, I become needy. <laughs> I wish I was home with my wife. I wish I was home with my son. And and I just, I don't know if I can do it. But I preach Wednesday night. And I had several people. I mean, I can't, maybe five people that came up to me and told me I needed to hear that sermon. Um, so God, God moved through it. God was doing powerful things. Um, it was that sermon where I spoke about that. Um, you can't just create your mess and then relabel it a storm. Uh, and that somewhere when you fall, you're still identified as a, ch as a child of God. And, um, and listen, I just want to encourage you this morning. You are a child of God. That arch is where we're at. He's watching every step. He's guiding every step. And this is why I truly believe that we're stepping into something um, that God has in store for us. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6 um, this morning. Um, Pastor Wells, he's, um, he is a character. Amen. <laughs> Um, very, very funny, um, a lot of insights, a lot of experience in ministry. He told me this story. Um, he said he was 16 years old when his dad owned a lawn mowing um, service. Pastor Wells' dad, Pastor Wells dad instructed him to dump trash and, uh, and to not touch any of it. Um, some of you guys might have heard this story already. Um, he says, throw it all away. Don't touch any of it. When they were, when, when they were dumping the truck... They found a gold mine of baby roots. How many of you guys like baby roots? How many of you guys like candy? All right, just picture your favorite candy, right? They thought that their dad was keeping them away from the candy. So what they did was they didn't just throw it all away. They began to indulge in all of the candy that they saw. And as they're in, their three, four candies in. Um, him and his brother begin to um, open the, the, the one that they realized they opened this wrapper, and they found out that there was maggots in this candy. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and somewhere, Pastor Wells says, I began to realize some things. <laughs> that he wasn't trying to keep things away from me. He wasn't, that my dad wasn't trying to keep good things away from me. He was just trying to help me out. Can I tell you this morning, children of God, that the Father sees what we don't see. That somewhere there are things in life that are presented to you that have these fancy wrappers. That only God can see through them. And only God knows why he tells us to steer away from the bad things that might look good to you. And somewhere we're going to have to learn how to manage. Say amen when your God has given us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12. You can say amen when you're there. It says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach. I'm going to switch to my New King James Version, all right? Verse 13, for food, food's for the stomach and the stomach's for the food, but God will destroy both, the, both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Shout Amen. And the Lord for the body, verse 14, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise, up, raise us up um, by his power. I want to preach a sermon that I've entitled, When Good um, Becomes Bad, this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God, that you give us. God, I pray that you will touch every single person, God, here this morning. God, I do not come by my own talents and abilities, Father, but I trust that you can anoint my words, God, and that people can grow from here, God, and begin to realize that you have given us good things, God. God, but somewhere we have to learn how to manage them. And not only that, but you steer us away from bad things in life, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said this morning, when good becomes bad. I want to start off with my first thought, and that is how good things can become bad. And I want to give you guys just common scenarios in life, just personal experiences. You know, it is a challenge many times as a pastor to counsel people. And many times that challenge is because you tell them to do something and they go and they do the opposite. You tell them to, you know what, don't go to this or don't 
do this or don't say those, thi those things or don't treat them that way. And they go and they do exactly what they want to do. Many times um, people come for counseling already with their mind made up. Many times they'll seek counseling and what they'll do is they'll seek people who will tell them what they want to hear. But see, somewhere we have to realize that many times God will speak and God will give us direction and clarity with the idea that you will listen to that. That somewhere you can pay attention to the instruct instructions. We see this illustrations that made all of you guys cringe. And that is that his father told him, don't touch this. Didn't so much give him an explanation, but gave him instructions. See, many times in life we have things that are lawful for us. And we spoke about this, um, if I believe it was Wednesday, uh, or it might have been Sunday night, that you have the right to do things. God has given you a free will. And some, a lot of things in life are lawful for you. Yes, you can go and be promiscuous. Yes, you can go and listen to whatever you want. This is why people many times will be like, I don't need to go to church. I, I can do whatever I want. Well, yeah, you can. It's lawful for you. You are this human being, this free moral agent that has that ability but you can't separate your actions from consequences. You can't separate what you're going to do from things that are that, that, that because of your actions and your decisions, you're going to have to experience. Everything is lawful, but not everything is helpful. See, there's many times where good things in life begin to turn bad. bad. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And God gives you good things in life. Can I get one witness this morning? God gives you blessings and he gives you talents. He gives you um, spiritual gifts and he gives you all these different things. But with that comes the responsibility of you learning how to manage those things. When you don't govern things that God gave you, many times they can become dangerous for your faith. Now, there's things in ministry, right? We speak about leadership and all, and all these different things that God may give you attributes and qualities and blessings. But there's a little bit, let's bring it down just a notch as far as um, life goes. There's times where God will, well, I mean, there's things, all of us here, there are things that God has given us that's good for us, like food. Okay, I got two amens right there. You guys were, you guys were fellowship in a chicken shack when I was gone, all right? <laughs> you guys don't lie to me. Food is good, all right? Food is good. There's certain things. There's certain foods that all I have to do is say Chinese food, and you're, you're already you're dro you're drooling in your mind, or maybe physically, right? <laughs> There's food. Can I preach to the choir this morning? Not only food, but sex is good. Amen. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Money. Money many times brings a short place where you buy something, and it brings happiness sometimes. You know, you, you work hard for something, and you finally buy it, and it brings, there are good things that God gives us. But you see, if you're not careful, especially in those three things, they can all get out of hand if not managed. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. There's conditions, there's limits, there's parameters, there's margins in, in these things that God gives you in food. There's, it's called gluttony. That's somewhere you can, you can get to a place where you don't manage it. You begin to, you know, f fall under an addiction, if you, if you will, even in food. And you don't care of what you have to do to get to it. We can go on in a whole different sermon when it comes down to sex and sexual immorality. See, sex is made by God. This was given. It was, a, it was a gift that was given to the married couple that you can express your love in this manner in marriage and in the confines of two, uh, a man and a woman. Amen? That they can express their love between each other. But the world begins to take this gift that God has given us and bring it outside of the margins, outside of, um, outside of the parameters that God gave us. It might be lawful. Yes, you can go and be promiscuous. Yes, you can go and have multiple partners. Yes, you can go and do all of these different things. But that's not what God says. And because that's not what God says, there are 
consequences or things you will suffer. For example, a teenager who awakens love. We know the scripture, don't awaken love before it's time. And if he begins to do that, loses purity, many times begins to affect his future marriage and life. It's what God made. He gave it. Many times we can mismanage it. Not only food, not only sex, but money. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. It says, for the love of money, say with me, love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, money is resourceful. Uh, my father-in-law and I we were watching, uh, we were listening to on the way to Seattle this, this book that was pretty, um, pretty good. I believe it's Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Poor Dad, Rich Dad. Um, and he was speaking about just things, how you... How you how these two dads view things, and one of the thing one of the things they said was uh, many people work for money, but you're not truly rich until you have money working for you. It's a resource. It's not your God. It's not what you should be slaving for. And I understand there is a place in life, and I understand where we're all at many times in life where we have to do things to make money. But see, somewhere you don't serve money. It's resourceful when used for good, but many times they can become the reason of a lot of evil things. We see people kill over silver necklaces, gold necklaces. We see people kill over money, kill over debt. Oh, he owes me. You know, you know all these drug deals. Many times you hear people kill, get killed over just bags of drugs or things that they owe. It's when good becomes bad. God will give us these things, and somewhere we begin to take it out of the parameters. They say, or at least I've noticed, that most of the sins that we experience is just what God has given us and taken out of context. Like pride. How many of you guys know you should be prideful for who you are? You're a son of God. That should make you walk with your chest high. Right? Chin up. And somebody, but if you're not careful, you can become self-righteous. And many times, sex again. Somewhere you take it out of these parameters, these, these margins, it, be, it becomes twisted. That's what God tells um, Adam and Eve in the garden, says you can have everything except this. He puts a condition on there. I'm going to move on to my second thought, and that is the dominating factor. So how do we measure lawful then? If everything's lawful for me, how do I make sure I'm not stepping into things that, that's not going to benefit me? you got to ask yourself questions. You guys know it's good to talk to yourself. It's, 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 it's what you say to yourself. You know, a lot of times it matters. Many times we speak negativity into our, in, in our minds, and that's how we act. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is it building you up or is it tearing you up? Is it helping you be more profitable, profitable for the Lord, or is it distracting you? These are questions you ask yourself about things that you get involved in, hobbies. Was, is, is it stealing where you, the time, or is it literally just a hobby? I mean, somewhere you got to begin to ask yourself and begin to question some things. Don't just give yourself because it's lawful. Let's consider thing in Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. Daniel chapter 1, verse 5, um, this morning. Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. You can say amen when you're there. It says, And the king appointed for them a daily provision for the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Verse 6. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Benaiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to them, the chief of Enoch's um, gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hanea Shadrach, to Mishael uh, Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. In other words, he won't eat what the king has given him, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This is the way we should think about things. Daniel here is given something from the king, the man who's in charge. 
that he can just command somebody to come and kill him. But in the mind of Daniel, says these things, because he's a Jew, there's certain things that he doesn't eat because God said so. He says, this will defile me. Can I tell you, church, it doesn't matter who the heck says you need to do something. If it doesn't go along with the word of God, don't do it. It doesn't matter who it is. I, I don't care how famous he is. I don't care if it's Donald Trump. I don't care who it is. It has to line up with the word of God. It has to line up with the gospel. And somewhere you have to, yes, it might be lawful for you. Yes, somewhere it might be even um, tempting for you. But does it edify me or does it defile me? This is where you see many people get, have a loss of dominion in life. That God would do something powerful in their life, deliver them, and do something powerful in their mind. And somewhere they begin to give themselves up to things that they shouldn't. Begins to get distracted. They begin to turn their, their back on the very thing or the very person that has saved them. Loss of dominion. In our scripture, that all things are lawful. The NIV, it says, things that are beneficial. Things at the NOT, things that are, that are good become enslavement. The ESV is lawful. MSG, all things are lawful, but many are unhelpful. Do not edify. See, when you come under the power of anything, there is a loss of dominion. I forgot where I heard this, but it says if you don't stand for anything, then you'll fall for everything. And somewhere, you know, if you don't know where your parameters are, if you don't have any standards, if you don't have any guides, any, any convictions. Some of you guys know we have to have convictions. There are certain things as Christians we just don't do. We don't get involved. Yes, I can do it. It's, it's always funny when people come into my house like, you don't have a TV? It's like, no. Why? Because I don't want to. Because somewhere there's conviction, somewhere there's, there's standards that we, that we follow, that we allow, that, that somewhere it makes sense to us because it's not edifying to us. I had somebody the other day say, why don't you drink? Said, why don't you drink alcohol? I said, because I'm a Christian. He's like, well, so your religion doesn't let you. No, <laughs> I can do whatever I want. You know, I can, I can do whatever I want. I just choose not to because it doesn't edify me. I just choose not to because it's not beneficial to me. It's lawful for me. I can do whatever I want. You can do whatever you want. But see, if you're saved and you want to live a, a righteous life and you want to follow Christ, there are going to be certain things you're not going to do. When you come on the power of anything, you begin to lose your authority. See, this word dominion, it means the right to rule. So whenever you say you have dominion, what you're saying is I've taken control. I've, I, I am the boss. You guys ever play um, um, Capture the Flag? I think that's how you say it. Whenever um, each team has a flag and you have to um, try to get it and you're, um, they're trying to stop you. I don't remember quite how it is. How many of you guys remember capturing that flag? Yeah, you're like, yeah, I'm in control. <laughs> you know, you take the flag and you, and you take off. Or whatever the case was. Listen, that's, that's the idea of dominion. That's somewhere you, you took dominion over your life, your mind. Can I tell you, you can have dominion over your mind. Turn to your neighbor. Tell him, you are not a victim of your mind. Many times we think that our mind tells us what to do. Well, actually, let me rephrase that because many times your mind does tell you what to do. But that's not how it should be. You're not just a victim of it. You can control your mind. As the Bible says, renew your mind. It didn't say, God, renew my mind. It's, no, it says, renew your mind. That somewhere you begin to work at this. That somewhere you begin to get a hold of God. You have control. And whenever you're willing to give yourself up to everything just because it's lawful, you, fight, you begin to compromise and give out this dominion. You rule. I see people many times, they, they're, ruled of, um, they're, they're under the rule of money. They're under the rule of sex. They're under the rule of food. They're under the rule of relationships, under all kinds of different rules because they've given themselves up to that. You know, many times if you trace back your addictions, if you trace back any type of um, strongholds that you have, you can find an open door. You can find somewhere where you, perp you literally grab the key, unlocked it, opened it, and you stepped in there. 
Many times you can just trace it back and say, man, that's where I messed up. That's where I crossed that line. I want to close with this, and that is liberties in Christ. Some of you guys know that God gives us liberties. He gives us freedom. Actually, there is no other true freedom in this world except in Christ. You might think there is, or they might say that there is. I mean, if you guys ever heard people say, well, religion just oppresses you. Or Christianity just, it just oppresses you. Just a, b- a bunch of do's and don'ts. And it's like, see me, I can do whatever I want. At least that's what they think. They say it, but they're following trends. You know, they keep up with the Kardashians. They keep up with, with all the things that people say. And some where they, they, they'll, they'll die if they get rejected by the world. And some where, listen, true freedom is found in Christ. Whenever you're washed from that and you're just like, man, I can live my life. Not needing alcohol. Not needing drugs. That I don't need all these different things that might be lawful for me, but I can have everything in Christ. This is why it makes sense to Paul. It makes sense whenever he has a thorn in his flesh and, Paul, and God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient. It makes sense to him. For somebody that's not saved or for somebody that's backslidden, that doesn't make sense. Grace? I want freedom. But see, for somebody saved, grace is freedom. That I can walk in the steps of my God. That I can walk in the spirits of God. And this grace begins to overwhelm me. And that I don't need things to make me happy because I can find it in God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That somewhere where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That you can live your life. Can I tell you, listen, Christianity is not boring. If it's boring to you, you're doing something wrong. If it, if, listen, if it's boring to you, if it's a burden to you, there's something wrong. I've, some of the greatest experiences in life has been when I've been saved. Some of the craziest things I've experienced have been in church. I remember one time somebody tried to fight my pastor. <laughs> Where I was in Houston, and we're, and you know, and somewhere we're, it was, it was a cool experience. I want to tell you, <laughs> we were there, we were all blocking them. We were like, no, oh. and he's like, oh, let me out. Of it. I saw that. I've seen demons manifest in, in in church. I saw this lady walk in church backwards. It was it was the weirdest thing ever. I don't know if it was a demon or she was just high. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> She's walking in backwards. She came to the altar. Like if we can just picture somebody, she went, and then took off. <laughs> <laughs> Then she flew away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but she took off. I've seen, I, I, we've seen all kinds of crazy things. I remember praying for a girl one time because she was being loud, and we took her out to the lobby. Um, I was a door director, so I, I was just, you know, I was the one that had to pray because Pastor was preaching, uh, Pastor Larry. So I laid hands on her, and she began to squirm. Like, ah. And then the usher had to come, and we, it was the weirdest thing. If you would have walked into church at that moment, <laughs> It would have been crazy because we, we had her against the wall, my hands on there, and we're just like, oh, my, she was just crazy. We prayed for her and left. I mean, just, just the liberty. I remember, check this out, in Galveston, um, I had a guy come. He was, um, he was a Honduran. He um, was having trouble in service, and, you know, in summer, I'm like, man, when I finish the service, I want to go pray for him. Um, so, actually, I didn't even have to go up to him. He came up to me and said, Pastor, I need prayer. And I was like, okay, what do you want to do? And um, so we went into a room, and we began, I began to talk to him. I don't know the guy. And he goes, Pastor, I have a lot of different spirits. Um, and he, it's, it's crazy because he admitted it to me. He said, I've been in a lot of sexual relationships, a lot of adulterous relationships where people are married. And he's like, and, and I, can't, I have voices in my head. And I began to pray for that man. And as soon as I lay hands on him, I mean, it's all kinds of... I mean, he was like squirming and all. And listen, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying this to boast. But what I'm saying is that if you're not, if you're not having fun in Christian, that's clean Christian fun, amen? <laughs> that's all that is, all right? That's all that is. And you pray for people, you see them delivered. And you're like, my goodness. It's not a burden. There's liberty and freedom. True freedom is only found in Christ. So I'll leave you with this. Somewhere you're going to have to learn how to govern what is good. Some of you guys, God has given you talents. You have a voice. You have, you have some type of talent. You can play an instrument, a testimony. I mean, all kinds of different things that God gives you as resources. 
You're going to have to use it for good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 says, Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over living things that move on the earth. God calls creation good. He blesses it. God said to govern. He says, Go and have dominion over this. And see, we have a responsibility to govern what is good in our life. We have a responsibility to govern what God has given us and make sure that we keep it in the parameters. See, somewhere we're going to have to learn how to examine ourselves. So two things. I want to give you some tools. Okay, so let's just, I'm going to give you guys a nickname. You guys are governors, all right? You guys are governors of your life. All right, so you tell yourself what to do, right? At least you should. You can't be dominated by your desires and your pleasures. Somewhere you wake up and say, I, I, I hear this song all the time. It says, I'm going to wake up and drink a cup full of purpose this morning. And that's what you need to do. Somewhere live in the purpose of Christ. Amen? So one of the things that you need to do is examine yourself. And you look in the mirror and straight in the mirror and say, am I saved? Am I, am I living right? Is there things that I need to change? Is there strongholds that I need to work to, um, against? You know, sometimes things, you might look at yourself and, and there's things that you've been struggling, struggling with for years. But I don't want to tell you this morning, keep struggling. Because somewhere it'll break. Somewhere you're going to get deliverance. We see the walls of Jericho. We see Nehemiah walking around seven times. Sometimes it takes longer than just one prayer. Sometimes it takes longer than just a few weeks, a few months. I had one of my old Bibles that I was showing my wife. Um, that I wrote a note almost four years ago that God was going to do something. And I told my wife, I still believe it. I still, I remember writing it and taking, and, and dating it and putting, uh, putting um, um, what God said. And I told my wife, I still believe this. Not only examine yourself, but you have to be sensitive to the spirit. I want to be honest with you. That's something that, that I'm personally working with. Because I'm not that much of an emotional guy. I actually lack a lot of things. I wanna, I'm putting a sermon together that's, very personal to me, and it's called spiritual apathy, because um, I've, I've experienced apathy in different areas of my life, and many times we can fall into that, that we know the word, we know all these different things about Christianity, but you're not sensitive to what God, say, what God is saying. You're not sensitive to who the, what the Spirit is trying to move in you, was trying to create or guide you in, and somewhere that is something that you have to work towards. It's somewhere you begin to get, oh, God, help me be more sensitive God, help me listen to you. God, help me identify your voice. Some of, this is some of my prayers. God, help me, help me to identify when you speak and not my emotions and not, not my flesh. Reveal to me. I'm also putting another sermon together that I told my pastor the sermon title, and he laughed in my face. So if my pastor listens to this video, all right? <laughs> I call it the Bible origami. Um, in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, it says that we need to unfold the word of God. That somewhere they, we need to do more than just more than just reading. And God confirmed to me that that very thought in Harvesters. Um, Pastor Lamont, he says, he said this. He said, God needs or Jesus needs to be revealed, not taught. Because if you're taught, then somewhere you stop. But if it's revealed to you, it's a whole different ballgame. There's a relationship there. There's, a, there's an experience. There's a revelation. It's not all just about studying and, and, and being taught and all the theolog theological seminars and all these doctrinal stuff and the exhaustive reading of Greek and Ara Arabic words and all these. Listen, I got saved. I didn't know anything. I was as dumb as a hammer. I don't know if, I don't know if that's a saying. I just I made that up. <laughs> Maybe it might be as an, a nail, dumb as a nail. I don't know. <laughs> but I remember getting saved. I got a revelation. You know what that revelation was? I was going straight to hell. And I found Jesus, and he changed my life. And somewhere, listen, it needs to be, examine yourself and be sensitive. I remember going to conference as, a, as an 18-year-old kid, and I remember hearing God's voice clearly saying, I want you to preach the word of God. Clearly, I mean, just, I, I can't even explain just how clear it was. I knew it was God. Have you had that experience? You know, it, it doesn't make you feel weird when you hear other people, oh, God spoke to me. 
It shouldn't make you feel weird. Because God speaks. You got to be sensitive to what the, what the spirit, what God has to say. Let's close with the power shift. See, God, the creator of the world, has given you power over your life. You got to think about this. How many of you guys know God has eternal dominion? He has the right to rule over everything. But what he's done is that he's given you your life and said, here, have dominion. It's like a passing of the baton. It's like Elijah giving the mantle to Elisha. Or the switch in presidency. That someone, you're in charge now. This is yours. These parameters that you have, that you have a right to, this is yours. Your free will. God can give you dominion over what you don't have. God can give you dominion over the things that you experience in life. I want to encourage you this morning. Because maybe that's, that's, that's wrong. You lack dominion. You've ignored the things. You, you said, it's lawful for me. I'm just going to do it because nobody can tell me what to do anyway. Now you come to church and you're all messed up in your mind. You, you don't have dominion over things. You can't get anything done. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe you have sleepless nights. Maybe you're trying to break through some things and you just can't do it. I want to give you some hope this morning. I want to tell you that God can break out of this. That God can break you out of this. He can give you dominion. And that's somewhere you can have the right to rule over your mind and over your life. But the question is, can God take over your life one more time? Because in our scripture, the essence of it, it's not so much that I get to pick, but everything's lawful for me. But I'm going to do what my God says. That's the underlying revelation there. Is that at the end of the day, in my dominion, that God has given, he all, given me, all I'm doing is giving it back to God. God, you've given me this dominion. Guide me and tell me what to do, and I'll exercise that in my life. I wonder this morning if God can do that. Take over your life. Sit on the throne of your heart and say, I make the shots, I make the calls. See, if you can't do that, if you can't do that, then you can't follow Christ. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, if you want to follow me, then you have to carry your own cross. In other words, you have to die to yourself just like I did. You have to submit under the Father's will just like I did. And somewhere, listen, you're going to have to allow God to sit at the throne of your heart. Can I get every head bowed and every eye closed?